Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for today, grateful for this morning, grateful for another opportunity to fellowship and look into your word. Uh, I, just, I just ask that you'll bless our times uh, together uh, this morning, both in Sunday school and in the main service that follows. And um, just pray for a great day in you. I specifically ask that people would leave uh, our church today eternally changed in some way because of your word. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. I'm assuming I got the high sign up there from the folks. Um, there's a handout in the back. I don't know if we have anybody that's handing out the handout, but it's there for you should you want one. And let's open our Bibles if we could this morning to John 13. And verse 27. And as you know, we're continuing our study of angelology, uh, looking here at Satanology. So we've looked at Satan's existence, personhood, uh, names, and titles. Original state and first sin, in other words, how did Satan become Satan? And we're kind of finishing up here the tail end of Satanology as we take a look at his works or his methods. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 says that he was not unaware of Satan's schemes or methods or devices. And this is the whole um, blessing of getting into the subject of Satan. It's not, I don't know, how would you advertise this out to the community? Hey, come to Sugarland Bible Church. We're going to teach you about Satan. Pro probably won't pack them in necessarily. But at the same time, it's an extremely valuable study for the Christian because unless you give yourself to this area of theology, you really don't understand your, your adversary, the devil. Uh, one of my professors in seminary, J. Dwight Pentecost, wrote a book. I love the title of it. It's called Your Adversary, the Devil. And it's a book on Satanology. And most Christians, uh, quite frankly, don't even know they have an adversary. They have some kind of vague recollection of it somewhere. Somebody mentioned it somewhere kind of thing let alone have they ever given themselves to a specific study of their adversary. So that's what we're trying to do here in Satanology. So when we look at Satan's works, we're looking at his past works, his present works, because he's working right now, even as I'm talking. And then his future. Uh, we're going to see that there's a whole eschatology study of the end concerning Satan. And the Bible has a lot to say about all of these things. So this is some of the ground we covered. We started this last time, if memory serves. And where we left off on was John 13, verse 27. You might want to open your Bible there. One of the things that Satan did in the past is he actually entered into Judas. And it says in John 13, verse 27, in the upper room, it says, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, he said to him, what you do, uh, do quickly. So one of the things Satan did in the past is he actually entered into a human being. And there are basically two people in the Bible that I think Satan specifically does this with. Both of them have the name son of perdition or son of destruction. You'll find Judas over in John 17, while we're there, verse 12, called the son of destruction. Jesus says, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I have guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, sometimes called the son of 
destruction so that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Judas is given that name, son of perdition, son of destruction. Anybody know the other person in the Bible called the son of destruction? The Antichrist. I know, it was right on the tip of your tongue. He, <laughs> he is also called the son of destruction in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. So you'll notice that when Satan gets down to the big projects, in Judas's case, uh, betraying Christ, and in the Antichrist case, eradicating the chosen people, he actually steps in for the big jobs and actually goes inside of people, enters people. That's what we call possession. Now there's sort of a question, and I wasn't planning on dealing with it today, but it's coming. When we get to demonology, uh, we're gonna be getting into the subject of demon possession. Does it occur today? What can we do about it if it does occur today? Those kinds of issues. And unfortunately, most people get their theology from the movie, The Exorcist. And they really haven't investigated what the Bible says about these particular subjects. But we'll get into that subject. And I'll try to make the case that I don't think a born-again Christian can be possessed. And you say, well, you don't, you don't know my high school kids very well, do you? A born-again Christian, I don't think, can be possessed by Satan or one of his minions, a demon. Oppressed, yes. Influence, yes. Possessed, no. For the simple reason that I don't think God and Satan can be roommates. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So more on that later. But that is something Satan did in the past. He actually possessed Judas to fulfill the final aspect of Christ's uh, betrayal. Something else Satan did in the past is he hindered Paul. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18 just for a moment. He hindered Paul. Paul says something very interesting to the Thessalonians. He says, for we wanted to come to you. In other words, I had the right motives. I, Paul, more than once. In other words, more than once, I wanted to come to you. And then he says, yet Satan hindered us, hindered us. So one of the things Satan did with Paul's ministry is he tried to throw so many monkey wrenches into the wheels that the thing wouldn't work right. And there's a lot of people out there that think if they step out and they do something for God and if everything doesn't go right or if they experience any opposition, they must be outside of God's will. But you'll notice that Paul himself was directly in the will of God. I don't know if there could be a man on the earth other than Christ himself more in the will than, than Paul. And yet Paul the Apostle specifically said that there are multiple times in my ministry where I came and wanted to come, but Satan threw up a roadblock. I very much appreciate what Paul says over in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9 where he says, for a wide door for effective service has been opened to me. So he trusted God to open doors and close doors for effective ministry. And then I'm so glad the verse doesn't stop there. For a wide door, and this isn't a small door, this is a wide door that God opened. Paul was being very effective and most of us stop reading the verse right there, but if you keep reading it, he says, but there are many adversaries. So there's not one adversary, there's a bunch of opponents, and they're harassing me, despite the fact that God has opened a wide door for effective service to me. So just because God opens a door for you or for any of us doesn't uh, mean that there's not problems and there's not opposition. In fact, the level of opposition you face could very well be indicative of the fact of the door that God has opened. Because do you think the adversary is just going to sit there and let you do whatever you want? I mean, that's like when I played basketball. I know you're tired of all these basketball stories, but that's my one five-second claim to fame is basketball. And even then, it wasn't much. I mean, I was basically coming off the bench at best. But you don't need to know about that, do you? 
um, you, the coach always told you you don't let the other let, you don't let the other team do what they want to do. You know, if, if one guy likes to shoot from this corner and he's good at it, you don't let him get the ball over there. See, and this is how Satan operates. He's not going to let you do what you want to do. He's not going to let you do what you're good at because he's trying to thwart the plan and program of God. So he uh, opposed Paul. Beyond that, he did something else to Paul. He actually afflicted him. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, a tremendous passage on suffering, our doctrine of suffering. Paul says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations... In other words, Paul, earlier in the chapter, having been caught up to the third heaven, heard things that other people don't hear. And that would no doubt go to his ego, wouldn't it? So God can't use an egotistical person. So what did God allow to happen because of this problem of pride? He allowed Satan temporarily to have his way with Paul in a certain area. He says, because of the surpassing revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, doesn't that sound like it hurts, whatever it is? People speculate as to what the thorn in the flesh was. I don't really know. I just know it hurt. It could have been something physical, emotional, relational. I have a tendency to think it was the whole Corinthian church that was his (laughs) thorn thorn in the flesh because these people just rose up against Paul all the time. A thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan. Now, do you see that there? Satan didn't even harass Paul himself. In this instance, anyway, he used a, one of his uh, uh, underlings to do it. So Satan steps in for the big projects, and the smaller projects he kind of delegates to others. Because you hear a lot of Christians today, you know, they narrate their stories and how they were fighting Satan and all this stuff. And not to deflate anybody's ego, but I think Satan probably has more important things to do. Um, He's probably doing something big on the earth and he assigns kind of the uh, yapping dogs. What do they call them? Uh, What am I looking for? Chihuahuas. (laughs) to us but you notice that Paul here said had he had a a thorn in the flesh from the messenger of Satan he says to keep me from exalting myself concerning this I implored the Lord three times that it might leave now obviously Paul didn't go to a health and wealth church right because they teach that if you have any problems financially or in your physical body you just speak it away and it goes away So obviously Paul didn't embrace that theology, even though he implored the Lord three times to take it away. Verse 9, he, that's God, or Christ, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Aren't you glad about that? Because I feel very weak many times. And when we're weakest, that's when we're actually strongest. Most gladly, therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses so that the power of God may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses and insults and distresses and persecutions and difficulties. Notice how all of these words are in the plural. It wasn't just an ongoing issue. These were perpetual conflicts that he was facing. For Christ's sake, when I am weak, then I am strong. But that's something that Satan did in the past, at least indirectly, harassed the Apostle Paul. Something else Satan did in the past is he influenced, go over to Acts 5 if you could, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira to lie to the Holy Spirit. Acts 5 verses 3 and 4. Peter rebuking Ananias and Sapphira. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, 
Was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but lied to God. Now, the social justice people that are trying to mix communism with the Bible basically like to quote Acts 2, 41 through 47, where the Christians had all things in common. And they try to argue that, you know, we really, to be Christ-like, should bring Marxism, you know, to the United States. That's basically what they're trying to say. And they never quote verses 3 and 4 of Acts 5. Because Peter, when he rebukes Ananias and Sapphira, specifically tells them, while the land was yours, you were free to do whatever you wanted with it. And after you sold it, you were free to do whatever you wanted with the proceeds of the land. So the sin of Ananias and Sapphira was not so much the fact that they kept back property from the church. They could could do whatever they want with the property. So the reality of the situation is the Bible is actually, when you study it out, is a pro-private property book. It's anti-communism. And it's far more pro-capitalistic and pro-ownership of private property God has no problem with owning private property. In fact, when you study the Ten Commandments, what you'll see is each commandment is designed as a negative to protect a positive. So when God says don't lie, uh, he's basically promoting truth. When he says don't murder, he's protecting the sanctity of life. When he says don't commit adultery, he's protecting the sanctity of marriage. And there is not, not just one, but two commandments protecting private property. Those are, which commandments? Don't steal and don't what? Covet, which is basically where communism has inroads. Because so-and-so, the rich guy down the street, obviously got his money because he stole it from somebody else or oppressed someone to get it. He didn't get that money through industry or hard work or creativity. And so what you need to do is you need to vote someone into power that's going to take his money and recycle it back to you so all of your student loans can get paid off. And basically what is that? Well, that's institutionalized theft. That's basically what I would call stealing. And so communism itself goes against God's word. The ownership of private property... Uh, does not. So Ananias and Sapphira were free to do whatever they wanted with that property. The problem, though, with Ananias and Sapphira is not that they held back part of the proceeds for themselves, when you study Acts 5, is they lied about it. See that? They misrepresented their level of generosity. So they stood up in front of the whole church and they said, hey, we just took a piece of property and we sold it. And we gave all of our proceeds to the church. But they didn't. They kept back part of the proceeds for themselves, which really wouldn't have been a problem, as I've tried to explain. But they misrepresented their level of generosity. We gave all of the proceeds to the church when they, in fact, hadn't. And it's for that sin that they were what we call slain in the Holy Spirit. And I bring that up because... A lot of people today are trying to get slain in the Holy Spirit. And I don't really see that as a particularly good thing. Uh, It looks to me like a negative thing. They get slain in the Holy Spirit. In other words, they experience what we would call maximum divine discipline. And I have every conviction that Ananias and Sapphira were, were Christians. Sort of the Calvinist way of handling these types of passages, because they think every Christian has to persevere in good works to the end of their life, or they're not saved, is the Calvinists will kind of make people like this unbelievers. So they really weren't believers. But when you look at verse 11, uh, it says there, and great fear came upon the what? The whole church. Now, would the church be afraid if an unbeliever was struck dead? Maybe so, but... There's much more fear in the church when one of their own just got taken home to the Lord early. 
And the fact that the church fell into a state of fear and the fact that all of these things are taking place inside the church to me is indicative of the fact that Ananias and Sapphira were in fact uh, Christians. And when you look down at verse 8, you see exactly who it was that was exploiting this fleshly issue in the life of Ananias and Sapphira. What you have to understand about about a new infant, that's what the early church is here. It's a brand new infant. It just was birthed a few chapters earlier. Is an infant is vulnerable to all kinds of diseases and all kinds of physical problems. And so you're always protective of a newborn. And God is protective of his newborn, the newborn church. And he wasn't going to allow a sin of this magnitude to take place within the church. So does God work in this way exactly today? Maybe in some cases he does. I think if he worked this way all the time, we wouldn't have many church members anymore. (laughs) But when you look at verse eight, you see very clearly who the problem is as Peter is rebuking Ananias and Sapphira. Peter responded to her, tell me whether the land, whether you sold the land for such And such a price, and he said yes. And let's see, have I lost my path here? Where does it say Satan has filled your heart? Somebody help me with that. Verse Verse 3, there we go. There we go. Verse 3. Because you get nervous when you're up here. Your brain doesn't think right. Particularly when you want to make a point, and you're pointing to a verse, and the verse isn't saying what you think it should say. But you know it's in there somewhere, so that's why i got to trust you guys, amen? And you guys are very trustworthy. All right, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Now, the Greek there is plerao. It's actually the same Greek expression or verb used in Ephesians 5, verse 18, where we are told to be filled, plerao, with what? The Holy Spirit. So just as we are to be dominated by the Holy Spirit, apparently Ananias and Sapphira, it doesn't say they were possessed, but it says they were filled with Satan and Satan's devices here. And so this becomes a key passage that you can point to that Satan can and does use Christians. Can Satan possess a Christian? No. Can a demon possess a Christian? No. Can Satan influence a Christian? Yes. Can Satan oppress a Christian? Yes. And it largely is related to the ground that we give him by surrendering back to the old nature. I have an ability as a Christian to return to my old nature anytime I want to. Does anybody else have that problem in here or am I the only one? And the people that didn't put up their hands are in their old nature right now because they're (laughs) they're lying right the problem is when we go back to the old nature we give satan influence in our lives ephesians 4 26 and 27 says do not let the sun go down on your anger now when i read that the first time i said well i need to move to alaska because i could stay angry all the time No, that's not the point. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. What's the rest of the verse say? Lest you give the devil a foothold. So there's a perfect example. If I'm going to harbor to my old nature by being bitter towards people, Satan, that bitterness is not designed to stay inside of us. God did not design us to hold bitterness inside of us. So if you're angry at somebody, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to vomit that out. And sadly, what happens is nine times out of ten, it comes out on some innocent party that doesn't even have any idea why you're upset in the first place. Uh, Your husband, your wife, your spouse, it, it can come out on our kids, even our grandkids. And so the Bible is very clear that we're not to be people of bitterness, And the only way to not be a bitter person is to learn to forgive, Ephesians 4, around verse 32, forgive as you have been 
forgiven. Well, I, I, don't, I demand justice from this person. That's what bitterness is. You want justice. And we forget the fact that the Lord hasn't treated us with justice. God has obligated himself to treat us with grace. And so if that's how the Lord has treated me, maybe I should extend that grace as I grow in Christ to other people. And actually there's a whole parable about this in Matthew 18 where one guy or another guy, I forgot the exact figure, it's a vast sum of money that's unpayable. And that guy uh, forgave the debt. And the guy who was forgiven of the debt found someone that owned, uh, owed him a couple of bucks or something and demanded, you know, that that last penny be paid and throw him in prison, you know, if he doesn't pay it back. And the whole parable is designed to get us to, to, to see how ridiculous we look when we demand justice in personal relationships, when God, who has forgiven us everything, has not treated us with justice he's treated us with grace and to the extent that I don't do that is the extent I give Satan a foothold see that so that would be an example of how Satan uses the carnality of people I think Satan is much happier using a Christian to do his work than he is a non-Christian the non-Christian he owns completely they're on the slave market of sin they have almost I would say no choice in the matter but if he can get a Christian, particularly a Christian that God has used in the past to tear down or jealousy or whatever it is, then he's actually won a huge victory. But that's something he did in the past. He influenced Ananias and Sapphira to lie. Acts chapter 5. All right, let's move on to what is Satan doing right now? Take a look at Luke 8 and verse 12. Lots of things Satan is doing right now, even as I am speaking, he's doing it. Luke chapter 8 and verse 12. What does he say here? In one of the parables, I think this is the parable of the sower. Then... then those beside the road are those who have heard, that would be the word of God. Then the devil comes and takes away, from, takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. So one of the things Satan does is he snatches the word of God away from people. Those that founded the United States of America clearly understood this because this is the beginning here of America's public school system. This is the very first public school established in America in Massachusetts, 1642, a century and a half roughly, give or take, before our American Revolution. And it's really funny to me to watch all of these people on TV and these cable type people saying religion and Christianity has no place in the public schools. Well, those that founded America didn't believe that. And they wrote this law into effect in 1642. It being one chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scripture as in former time. Now that's 1642, what former time are they talking about? These were the children of the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation took place in Europe. So these are those within the spiritual heritage or lineage of those who launched the Protestant Reformation. And what was the Protestant Reformation about? It was a reaction against the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages when the scripture was inaccessible. Before the Protestant reformers started to teach the priesthood of all believers, the Bibles were up here on pulpits all over Europe, chained to the pulpit. You were not allowed to own a Bible. You were told, uh, even if you own a Bible, which they weren't, Luther is the one that really started to translate the Bible into the common language. You can't understand what it says. And beyond that, they didn't have a Bible in their own language. The only thing available was what's called the Latin Vulgate. 
So you would go to church and hear a bunch of stuff and you'd have no understanding of, you know, what it is that was being communicated. And th- did Satan have a field day during that time period when people were ignorant of the knowledge of God? You bet. And the religious leaders loved it. Because as long as the people were kept ignorant, they could be manipulated. They could be told, well, you know, your Uncle Joe, you know, he's in purgatory right now. And he's sort of paying off some of his sins. And, you know, unless the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory won't spring. Right? And this was a money-making operation. And we've been to Vatican City and seen the absolute beauty of that establishment there in Rome. I mean, unbelievable architecture and paintings and on and on it goes. Well, how did they get all that money? They basically stole it from the people over centuries through what is called the sale of indulgences. And if you don't have a Bible where you can say, well, can you, uh, Mr. Religious Leader, Mr. Roman Catholic Priest, can you show me purgatory in the Bible? If you don't have a Bible, how can you check the abuses? You see that? So when those who came from Europe to America and established the American Republic, they said, we're not going to go back to that former time again, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. We're going to set up a public school we're going to, where we're going to teach people to read and write, and that's what you call grammar schools. Why do we have to study grammar? Because God has revealed himself linguistically. If God has revealed himself linguistically, then you have to understand the rules of language, right? So they set up these schools not to, to have their kids pick the best stocks and retire early, not to get the best STEM jobs, right? Because that's how, why we send our kids to school. We want to see our kids get ahead. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But these people set up schools so we don't return to the dark ages. So they said in 1642, it being one, of the, it being one chief project, look at that, not a little project, chief project, This is what Satan is trying to do. It being one chief project of that old Satan, uh, that old deluder Satan to keep men from a knowledge of the scriptures as in former times, dark ages, middle ages that we were rescued from via the Protestant Reformation. It is therefore ordered that after the Lord hath increased the settlement, they shall appoint one within their town to teach all such children. Look at the target they're going after here. Rightfully so. We've got to get these kids literate. Because if these kids aren't literate, they won't understand their priests. And they won't be reading the Bible for themselves. And we'll have a generation that just repeats everything that we got saved out of. Thank you, Protestant Reformation. So we ought to be targeting kids is what we ought to be doing. And I think Satan does a much better job targeting children than we do today. Because all of these things, I mean, there's a reason why Satan has wanted to take over the public schools. Because that's where the kids are. There's a reason they're doing story time in the public libraries all over the country through a transvestite that sits up there in front of the class and reads to the kids. They're targeting the kids. Do you see that? Because whoever controls the minds of the children controls the next generation. Shall appoint one within their town to teach all such children to read. They shall set up grammar schools to instruct the youths. So one of the things Satan works overtime in doing is he tries to keep people ignorant of the Bible. And there you see it in the parable of the sower where the word of God is taught. But before the word of God can have an effect, and Satan obviously knows the Bible can have an effect, because we know from Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, that when the scripture is proclaimed, it does not return what? It does not return void. I think it was Jeremiah that describes it as a hammer, breaking a rock. I mean, that's what the word of God will do if you let it germinate in your life. So, so someone hears the word of God, but before it can take any real root, 
Satan is somehow at work snatching what was originally sown. And after you become a Bible teacher, you, you see very fast how Satan does this. I mean, he uses anything to distract. Uh, you know, it's amazing the technical problems or the uh, issues with technology that we'll have. Technology works fine until you start teaching the Bible. Then all of a sudden you start getting these glitches. I mean, who's, uh, who's doing all of that? I mean, it's Satan. And here we are on social media, and if everything's working right, you know, my voice, and my voice isn't the important one, it's God's word, is going out to countless people. And I can guarantee you that even as I speak, and even as we try to get this uploaded on YouTube, there's going to be glitches and problems, and that's just part of the territory, because this is how Satan operates. He tries to stop the teaching of God's word. And that's why when you're sitting in church, it's very difficult to maintain concentration. Your mind goes everywhere. Oh yeah, I need to talk to so-and-so. I, uh, I need to go out to, you're thinking about what you're going to have for lunch later on. Now, if you go to the movies and you watch Star Wars, unbroken concentration. No problem at all. Because everybody today is telling me through these sociological studies that you got to keep it brief you got to keep it short, keep it to a sound bite, because the level of concentration in people is not what it used to be. Well, there may be some truth to that, but why? And they specifically argue this with kids. Kids can't concentrate. Well, when I'm in the movie Star Wars with a bunch of kids, they seem to be concentrating pretty good. Matter of fact, if you quiz them after the movie about the different characters, and I'm, I have a 13-year-old at home, so I'm kind of learning the new characters, uh, Ray, and you know, in the old days, it was just Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. Now there's all these new characters, and you, you query kids about the new characters, and they can go on and on and on and on and on about it. And my question is, well, if they can do that with a movie, why can't they do that with God's word? Well, there's a spiritual reason for this. It's right there in Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Satan snatches the word from people. And this is one of the reasons why we, it's in our bulletin, encourage people with young children. We try to say it nicer than what I'm going to say, I guess. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. But parents with young children, we have a wonderful nursery for kids. Why? Because if you have little tiny children in here that are screaming and yelling, what's everybody doing? They're looking at the little kids saying, oh, look at the little cute baby. And they're not focusing on what they should be focusing on, which is the teaching of God's word. And then we have spiritual warfare related to the contracting bladder. Where all of a sudden everybody thinks, gosh, we're right in the middle of a sermon. Now would be the great time to use the bathroom. Um, now, are we going to lock the doors and say, thus saith the Lord, don't go to the bathroom? <laughs> go and come as you need. Please, please do that. But I just find it's interesting that everybody has to use the bathroom in the middle of the teaching of God's word. You know, as you stand up here and teach, it's interesting to kind of observe people. You know, you guys are observing me. Well, I'm observing you. And a lot of people treat this kind of like it's an airline, you know. They're flying and, oh gosh, I need to get up and um, get a drink of water. So they'll kind of go back there, get a drink of water, talk to a few friends, come back in. Uh, okay, I'll listen for five more minutes. Not understanding that every single point we make builds on the prior point. So if you miss something in the middle, you're going to miss a latter point down the road because we do sequ sequential logical teaching. So all of that to say, the reason you're here at Sugarland Bible Church is to concentrate on God's word. Satan doesn't want you to concentrate on God's word because he does not want the word to have its effect on your life. Because he knows that if you're a Christian and you're absorbing God's word, understanding God's word, applying God's word, you're going to be a double threat, triple threat to him this week in your life and your place and your ministry. 
So Satan is always coming against the teaching of God's word. And um, just try to teach a Bible study and you'll immediately see it. You know, it's the outworking of Luke chapter 8 and verse 12. So, enough said about that. Amen? Something else Satan does is he rules the world. Look at 1 John chapter 5 verse 19. You guys got really quiet all of a sudden. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. We know that we are of God and that part of the world, doesn't say that, does it? The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And I like the way Lewis Berry Chafer described this verse. It's like a lullaby rocking a child to sleep. And that's what Satan is doing right now over this present world. He's been given authority over this world from Adam. The Bible is very clear on this. A few verses. He offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world. Matthew 4, verses 8 and 9. You can't offer something unless you control it. He is called the prince of this world. John 12, 31 John 14, verse 30, John 16, verse 11. He is called the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. He is called your adversary, the devil, who roams about. You remember what uh, God said to Satan when he presented himself to God in the book of Job? Job, I think it's around chapter 1, verse 7, right in there. Satan, where have you come from? God says to Satan, and what does Satan say? From roaming about the earth and going back and forth over it. So he is called uh, your adversary, the devil, the one who roams about like a roaring lion seeking to have a glass of iced tea with you. No, seeking to devour you. That's, that's, his, that's the domain he's been given, 1 Peter 5, 8. And then, of course, we just read 1 John 5, verse 19. That's why all of these insurance companies, you know, they call these catastrophes acts of God. I would prefer to call them acts of God, little g, rather than acts of God, big G, because God is still sovereign, as I'll show you in just a moment, but a lot of the catastrophes in our world, God has nothing to do with. You know, we blame God for a lot of things that God didn't cause. God never says all things are good. It says in Romans 8 that he uses all things for good. So don't blame God for everything that goes wrong in your life or in the world. The Bible is very clear that Satan is ruling the world. That's why that scenario is not going to change until the events of the book of Revelation that we've been studying in the main service. There is so much Exodus language, as we have pointed out in the book of Revelation. Because in the Exodus, God took his people, Israel, out of Egyptian bondage. In the book of Revelation, God is taking the whole planet out of the bondage it's been in ever since Genesis chapter 3. And until those end time events take place, we're living in the devil's world we're playing defense, and the Bible's very clear about this. Satan is a defeated foe, but he, we're living in a time period between his sentencing, first coming, said that wrong, his conviction, first coming, his sentencing, second coming. And we've got some lawyers in the back, and they know the difference between conviction and sentencing. Sometimes those are two totally different parts of a trial. Is that right in Texas? Is sentencing and conviction different parts of a trial? Okay, I know it works that way in California. So the lawyer we've got in our midst has now divulged himself. So he's going to need particular prayer. As I like to say, I fell from law to grace, you know. So Satan was convicted... First coming, sentence, second coming. See that? So he's a defeated foe, conviction. The jury verdict is in, but he's not going to be sentenced till the second coming. 
And just because you're convicted doesn't mean you're sentenced. So until he's actually sentenced, until the sentence is imposed where he's bound for a thousand years and then thrown into the lake of fire, until the great exodus occurs, Satan will continue to, to rule this world. Now that does not mean that God is not still sovereign, because he is. In Job chapter 1 verse 12 and Job chapter 2 verse 6, Satan had to request permission of God to uh, get into Job's life. So he requested that the hedge of protection be lowered. John 17 verse 15 it says Jesus is praying for us. Aren't you glad about that? And he's keeping us and protecting us. 1 John 4 verse 4 says, greater is he that's in you than what? He that's in the world. And I just showed you that tough verse, didn't I, in 1 John 5 19? But what about verse 18? You see the balance in verse 18? We know that no one who was born of God sins. Now I think that's talking about our new nature. The new nature cannot sin. But he who has been born of God, he who was born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. So God is sovereign and he protects us, but that doesn't subtract from verse 19, which says that the whole world lies within the lap of the uh, wicked one. And we know from 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 6 and 7 that there's a restrainer in the earth right now preventing Satan from doing exactly what he wants to do. So this is an area where we need to be balanced on. We're living in the devil's world, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't retain what we would call his universal kingdom. God's universal kingdom is always in effect, not his theocratic kingdom where he rules through a man. That was what was lost in Eden and won't be restored to the millennial kingdom, but his universal kingdom is always intact, and so, yes, Satan runs this world, but God, some way, somehow, retains his sovereignty. This is why Jesus said to Peter, Luke 22, around verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has what? Requested permission to sift you like wheat. There would be no need for the request if God somehow didn't retain his sovereignty. But having said all that, Satan very clearly is running this world. I'll tell you what else he's targeting right now is he's targeting your mind. He blinds the mind. The 9-11 hijackers did not have to get control of every square inch of the airplane. The only thing you have to control is where the pilot sits. If you control that, even though, I guess... We've got some pilots in here that can give probably more accurate statistics, but where the pilot sits represents a very small portion of the airplane. But if you can control that or influence that, you control the whole vehicle. See that? This is why the target of Satan is always towards the mind. This is why the Bible has so much to say about the mind. Mark 12, verse 30, we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our strength, and all of our mind. Why the mind? Because the mind is, you control the mind, you control the whole body. You control the mind, you, control, you can control the actions, you can control the destiny, you can, you can influence the behavior, you can influence the emotions. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, as a man thinks, so he is. See that? So there's lots and lots of Bible verses dealing with the subject of the mind. Romans 12 verse 2 says we ought to do what with our minds? Renew our minds. Why is there so much on the mind? Because the mind is the center. And if you allow God to influence your mind, then that will dictate the course of your life. If you allow Satan to influence your mind, that will dictate the course of your life. And if you give Satan 
5% of your mind. He'll take that. Whatever you're going to give him, he'll take. Because he knows if he can influence you in any way, he can influence your life as a Christian. So this is why Satan targets the mind. Uh, Where am I getting this from? I'm getting it from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. In whose case, well actually let me back up to verse 3. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. You know, there are some people you give them the gospel and it's like talking to a wall. I mean, it just doesn't seem to have any impact. And there's a reason for that. The reason for it is verses three and four, the gospel is veiled to them. They can't see it. Why can't they see it? The answer there is in verse four, in whose case, what case are we talking about? The person whose mind is veiled to the truth. In whose case, the God of this world, who would that be? Satan, has blinded the what? Minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel out of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. This is the problem with thinking that you can rationalize people into Christianity. Christianity is very rational. It's logical, there's a place for apologetics, but sometimes people think, well, if I just present these three arguments in airtight fashion, I'm gonna have an immediate convert. Not necessarily, because there's a spiritual interface at work where the person you're talking to could have their mind blinded. Now, I believe that God, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, John 16, verses 7 through 11, where Jesus specifically says, the Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and through the preaching of his word, which doesn't return void, can break through that blinding. But you can't do it through human argumentation. You have to do it through prayer and relying upon the resources God has given, the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, And also, you've got to stick with the Word of God because it's the Word of God that has power at the end of the day. Not our fine-sounding, logical, apologetic arguments. I'm pro-apologetics and defense of the faith and being articulate and all of that kind of stuff. But that doesn't pierce the blinding that people are under because of the activity of Satan. And Satan targets the mind here because he knows if he can target the mind, he controls the person. See that? It doesn't say he's attacking the gums or the liver or the teeth or the ribs. It says he's blinding the mind because of the biblical significance of mind. What else is Satan doing even as I am speaking? Not only is he blinding the mind, but he is actually sending into the world false Ministers, say it isn't so. You mean to tell me that everybody who stands up behind a pulpit and quotes the Bible is not working for God? Take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 14 and 15. No wonder... For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants, now some translate that as ministers, servants. Therefore, it is not surprising, or no wonder, uh, let me back up, for such men are false apostles, wow, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. You mean to tell me there are people that went by the title apostle in the Old Testament or in New Testament times that really weren't apostles? Yeah, and you'll find an example of them in Revelation 2, verse 2, where Jesus commends the church at Ephesus for testing those who claimed to be apostles and were not and found them to be liars. There are people even today that will tell you they're apostles. In which case I say, 
you look very good for your age because you ought to be about 2,000 years old by now. But there were people apparently running around in this time period claiming the mantle apostle. They weren't claiming to be pastor or deacon or Sunday school teacher. I mean, those are wonderful titles, but they went after the top title itself, apostles, and they weren't apostles at all. Verse 14, no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan wants the title apostle or savior or something spiritually sounding. Verse 15, therefore it is not surprising that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. But Paul says whose end will be according to their, according to their deeds. I love Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. To the church at Smyrna, Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You know what a synagogue was in this time period and still is? It's a religious meeting place. It's a place where the spiritual and religious people go to do their religious activities and John, Jesus through John says that what they're doing there in this case is a synagogue of Satan. Satan, you have to understand this, is in the religion business. The biggest problems that Jesus had when he was on the earth was not with the prostitutes and the tax gatherers and the fishermen and just your average blue collar people. The problem that he had that he always went toe to toe with was the religious people. The people that would get bent out of shape because he had the audacity to heal someone on the Sabbath and that went against their religious traditions. And you have to understand that Jesus had six trials. Three political, three religious. Three before Rome, but before those three trials occurred, he had three religious trials where the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who hated each other's guts. Did you know that? The Sadducees and the Pharisees disagreed with each other on all kinds of things. But when it came to Jesus, they all teamed up. Because the only people that they hated more than each other was Jesus. So we can get together to rush this guy through the judicial system to get him dead. And then once we kill him, we can go back to hating each other. <laughs> That's the religious crowd there of the first century. That's the synagogue of Satan. These are the false ministers that Paul is talking about. And because nobody talks like this or tells you about this, people channel surf and they watch a guy that comes on with a coat and tie and looks good and well-mannered and well-kempt, I guess we could say, and he's, he uses the Bible a little. Countless people are watching people like that all over this country, even this morning on so-called Christian television, and they, they just absorb that whatever the guy says, it's got to be true. Not understanding that Satan will deliberately put someone like that into a sphere of influence to deceive the masses. That's what Paul's talking about here. What else does Satan do while we're in 2 Corinthians 11? He sends a false gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. Look at verses 3 and 4. But I am afraid that just as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your what? Minds. There's the assault on the mind again. Your minds will be led astray from, watch this, from the simplicity, you should underline simplicity if you're an underliner, and purity of devotion to Christ. What he's worried about is just as Eve was beguiled from the very simple commandment in Genesis 2. Easiest job description on planet Earth. No prohibitions placed on them at all other than don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Simple. Simple command. 
He's basically worried that Satan is going to come into the Corinthian church and deceive them into taking the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is so simple, anyone can believe it and receive it. A child can receive it. But he's afraid that what is going to happen is Satan is going to slither in, just like he did into Eden, and he's going to take something simple and he's going to make it complicated. If you, those of you that are parents of young daughters will appreciate this in verse 2. He says, for I am jealous for you with a godless jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. He, Paul here puts himself in the role of dad, who's got the shotgun, and where we are in Texas, aren't we? So I don't need to be arrested for a hate crime. I think what I said was legal. Who's got the shotgun keeping the wrong suitor away from his daughter. Amen? Is that our responsibilities, dads? So just as a, a, a father is going to try to keep her daughter away from the wrong guy. So when the guy shows up at your door and you kind of look at him and he doesn't really, you know, you don't really envision him as the type of person, as a future marital partner with your daughter, and he says, I'm, I'm here for your daughter, then you just say, no, you're not, and you close the door, right? And you live in Texas and you got the shotgun. Come on now, I, I need to hear some amens out there. <laughs> so just as a dad is keeping away the wrong guys from his daughter, Paul is trying to keep the Corinthians away from a wrong gospel. See that? Because he knows that Satan's going to slither in and do his work just as he did to Eve. And then he says this, verse 4, For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, wow, whom we have not preached to you, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel, you should underline that, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. In other words, he uses sarcasm here. So just because the name Jesus is in it doesn't mean it's the right gospel. And you say, well, pastor, how do you recognize a true gospel from a false gospel? By the way, jot down Galatians 1 verse 8, and he mentions the false gospel there too. How do you recognize the difference? And I'm going to close with this. It's where the spotlight is. The more the spotlight is on Christ and what he did, the closer you are to truth. The more the spotlight is removed from Christ and placed on man and what man does and how man must sorrow and how man must do this and do that and do these three things or these five things or he's got to do these six things over here to keep himself saved and if he gets unsaved he's got to do more, five more things to get saved again you see what's happening there with the false gospel the focus isn't on Christ anymore it's on you the more you can start to see that it's not true because as Paul said earlier in the chapter the simplicity of the gospel the moment you turn the gospel into a works-oriented religious system, you know you're dealing with a false gospel. And that's what Satan is doing here. He's not just sending false ministers. He's sending false gospels. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for Satanology and what it reveals about our adversary, the devil. Make us a good stewards of these things as we seek to grow in you. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen.